understand me and I'm going to try to show you today how it is happening even from the pulpit even from those who should know better and this is going to be a four-part series this morning tonight Tuesday night and Thursday night and I wish that you all would come and and uh, hear what the Lord is saying to us uh, I notice sometimes you don't come but when I check on zoom you're not on zoom either I hate zoom but nonetheless we got to use it so if you're not here Make sure, make sure you uh, you are into the book. You're into Zoom, sorry, so that you can hear what is happening. My text is in Amos, chapter eight and verse eleven, and I'm going to try my best today, with the help of the Holy Ghost, to Im to impact you with the thought that you need to be strong in the Word of God. Now take that down for a little bit. We started the series last week where the Lord says to us, grow up. That's what he said Sunday morning, Sunday night, Tuesday night, Thursday night, grow up. We've got to grow up because the time is coming where we're not going to have anybody to depend upon. COVID should have taught us a lesson. Many persons ended up in the hospital or down at Harson's Cave. Not Harson's Cave, but Harson Point. There was nobody there. And what we're doing in church, pastors, and sometimes I'm guilty of this, is that we spoon feed you all the time so that when you have a need for something, you don't know what to do. So I've been trying for the last six months or so to get you to pray for yourself, to worship for yourself, understand the word of God for yourself. In other words, I've been trying to get you to grow up. And the Bible says how we can do that. How can we grow up? The Bible said that we should desire the sincere milk of the word that we might grow thereby. That's how a baby grows, is, is, is born, and then you start feeding it with Klim or, or Similac or breastfeed them or whatever the case may be. You should be desiring, that I shouldn't have to try to force the word of God down your throat. You are supposed to desire the word of God and to pull it out of me. We look at evidence of growth in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 8, and we try to compare this to a little baby being born. And we say after the baby is born, the baby learns how to put off certain things. Colossians 3 says, eight, these are some things we should put off. The baby's always pulling off his diaper and walking around. I nearly said bear pooch, but I can't say that from the pulpit. So um, I, wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that. But the baby is walking around, you know, because it's pulled off the, the diaper. Uh, so the Lord said, if you're grown up, let's see that you could put off some things. What are the things you should put off? Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication of your mouth. And then, like I said, when you look around, the baby is walking the tall. His shoes is putting on his mother's shoes, whether it's male or female. You know what I'm talking about? So the Bible also tells us that we should put on some things around verse 12, I think it is. And this is evidence that we are growing. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy, which is compassion, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. So we put off and we put on. It is important. We talked last week about the fact that we should grow in experiencing, performing, and whatever other word you want to use, miracles. Miracles are going to be important going forward. And the past is not always going to be there to lay hands on you. When the doctor says, I've done my best, I can't do anymore, you need a miracle. Huh? Sometimes when um, the rent is to be paid and there's no money coming in, you're going to need a miracle. But the fact that business people these days are somehow laying off all the workers and, and, and substituting computers and artificial intelligence and whatever, there comes a time, there's coming a time when you're going to be out of a job and you're going to need a miracle. And then when you read the signs of the end times that the Lord says in the book of Matthew or whatever, and when you hear about wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and earthquakes and all that, you are sometime or the other going to need a miracle. And you've got to learn to come to the place where you, where you grow in the Lord, where you can believe God for him to move supernaturally on your behalf. 
things are getting so rough. I've just been listening like only yesterday where I think it is in Uganda or Nigeria. Um, parents are burying 40 children that have been murdered in a Christian school having been attacked by, by Islam, Islamic fundamentalists. That's the time that you're going to need a miracle. I've been just listening to a lady who, who wrote a book saying, uh, the book is called, Lord, send me some place where nobody else wants to go. And the Lord sent her the backside of Uganda in the time when, I think it's the time when Idi Amin was uh, feasting on human beings. And the Lord sent her and, uh, and the trouble that she had. But today, we are seeing 11,000 people a week being born into the kingdom as a result of her going to that job and being faithful to the Lord. She came in contact with one of the persons who went often to kill her. And after they became friends, sitting over a meal one time, she asked him, well, you came to kill me. Why didn't you kill me? Now, she was just interviewed this week on CBN. I'm not talking about 50 years ago. CBN. She said, the time, we came at midnight to kill you many times. We could hear you praying inside there. But we see this bright light all the time. There was always this bright light and we were never able to see where you are. So that's why we didn't kill you. You are going to need a miracle sooner or later. A miracle is when God intervenes supernaturally and changes the normal course of nature. So sometimes we don't always need a miracle when we are sick. Sometimes we just need a healing because there's a difference. All right? So we move on from there, and I hope you're working on that. And there's some scriptures that you must, that you must know if you're going to expect God to move supernaturally. So you'll hear me say from this puppet, we want God to, we want to see the unusual, the uncommon, the supernatural. Church is just too bare these days. When you read church in the book of Acts, church was not as bare as we've seen it today. But there are some things that we have to do in order that we will see the might of God manifest in the church. This move of God is not only for the T.L. Osbournes and the Billy Grahams and, uh, uh, and people of that ilk. No, 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 no. It's for us. These signs shall follow them that believe. I think that might be Luke 16, 10. I'm not sure. These signs shall follow them that believe. And if you're a believer, it's going to follow you. In my name, they will cast out devils. So devils are still to be cast out today. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. That shall still happen. Let, let's read it. Everybody read it because it's important these days, I'm going to tell you soon, for the word of God to come out of your mouth. Look on the screen if you don't have it. Uh, if you don't have it in your Bibles or if you don't have a Bible. Let's all read. And these signs, everybody, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Wave your hand at me if you're a believer. Well, the signs shall follow you as well. Not only Oral Roberts, not only Kenneth Hagin, not only Kenneth Copeland, these signs shall follow you. Continue. In my name, in my name, they shall do what? Number one, cast out devils. Number two, they shall speak with new tongues. Number three, they shall take up serpents. Number four, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Number five, they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall go to the doctor first thing the next morning. They shall lay hands on the sick and whatever. And what, what, whatever will happen. It's time for me, the pastor of the church, stop, to stop telling you, you went to the doctor, you get the x-ray, you had the MRI. I'm really out of order to do that. I'm not saying that those things are not necessary. But I'm saying I should be building your faith. When you come to me, you say that you're sick, whatever. I should lay hands on you and determine in the, not only me, the, those who believe, everybody that believes. And we ought to be not the first ones at the clinic every Monday morning. Because we believe God. So today I'm going to try for the next four sessions, I'm going to try to get you to, to look at the word of God and change a little thing that we learn in Sunday school. We learn in Sunday school, if God said it, I believe it, that settles it. We got it the wrong way around. If God said it, that settles it, and I believe it. We learn, if God said it, we believe it, and that settles it. That settles it whether you believe it or not. So if God said it, we believe it. As if God said it, that settles it, and we believe it. Say that with me, if God said it. That settles it. And so we believe it. 
Let me give you evidence in Numbers chapter 23 and verse 19. Words that were spoken by not a false prophet, but a wicked prophet called Balaam. And God used him. Look what God said. Read every, I'm trying to get you to participate, participate. Amen. So read lowly everybody. God, God is not a man that he should lie. Man, if God said I'll supply all of your needs, stop begging and borrowing, whatever. Just wait. You have faith. Through, through faith, somebody find the scripture for me. Through faith and patience. You exercise your faith. Let patience have a perfect work before the answer comes. Before the answer comes, uh, we're out there begging and borrowing and whatever. Now, I don't want you to get condemned if you beg or borrow or whatever the case may be. I'm teaching and sometimes I have to go places that will make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. But it's just like the doctor says, your foot has gangrene and I got to chop off your foot. Well, he wouldn't say chop off, but because I want it to really sound bad, I say chop off. But you can't just pussyfoot around the place and say, yeah, 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 na, 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 na. You're going dead. So you got to come to the point. So sometimes I might come close to you and saying something. I might not know it's you or whatever, but it doesn't matter. I'm a teacher and I've got to do everything to make you understand. Because the Bible says in the parable of the sower that there are those when they hear the word of God and they understood it not. And the birds come and snatch it away. So my job is to make sure that you understand it. So don't get offended if I say some things that, you know. Let's get the scripture. Read everybody. Be not, start from B. B, be not slothful, but followers of them through, who? Through faith and patience. Did what? Inherit the promises. Miracles don't work like instant starch. You just pour water on it and it's done. You got to wait on God sometimes. And in that waiting period, some tremendous things are happening. When you sow a seed, the earth does so much to make that seed grow. The seed doesn't grow of itself. I hope you know that. I hope you know that the seed dies. But the soil in which it is sown, the Lord has put so many nutrients in that soil. So it is the soil that really causes the, 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 uh, the fruit to produce. The, the, seed to produce so you've got to god is working on your heart while you are waiting so the answers probably don't come the same time let me give you some examples there are times when the lord lay hands on the sick and they, rec they recovered on the other hand there were 10 lepers that were cleansed the lord prayed for them laid hands on them and said to them go show yourself to the priest well they didn't see anything but they just obey the word of God. And the Bible said, as they went. We could pray for you right now. While you're driving up Thornberry Hill, all of a sudden you realize that you can see. You don't need your spectacles again. That is how the word of God works. Well, all that was just an introduction to what I want to tell you today. And what I want to tell you today, my main text is in Amos chapter 8 and verse 11. If you don't understand anything else I'm saying, I'm trying to tell you this morning that you have to have a new look at the word of God. We are talking about the revival of the Bible. We are talking about you getting the Bible off your coffee table and getting it in your heart. We are talking about believing the Bible, trusting the Bible, acting on the Bible, and see the Bible come alive. That's what I'm talking about. Because here's what, what Amos said. And this is sad, but it's already happening. Behold, the days come. Well, saith the Lord, not even Amos, that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine for bread, not a thirst for water, but a famine for the hearing, not for the word. The word is around more than ever. It's printed, best, best book best-selling book for the last maybe the last hundred years every year so it's gonna be around now you can get it on your apps whatever so the word of God is gonna be around but the Bible said not a thirst of water or a famine for bread but of the hearing of the word of God the Lord said there comes a time when you're not gonna be hearing the word of God even from the pulpit where you expect to hear it because there are reasons why you're not hearing it from the pulpit I have some reasons I can share with you. One of the reasons is, is that pastor wants to make friends and influence people. A second reason is that pastor wants to see the congregation grow numerically. 
oh, those things are good. I want to see them too. But not at the expense of you not hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, even if it becomes offensive at some times. Because Jesus said that he didn't come, he come to bring a sword. And the preaching of the word of God can be offensive at some time. I don't know about you, but if I were not in the pulpit and I was sitting in the pew, I would prefer to have an offensive word than none at all. And the word is not necessarily designed to offend you. And don't forget that an offense is not given. An offense is taken. This body took offense at what you said. So if you stop taking offense, everything will be fine. It's an offense, check it out, an offense is not given. An offense is taken. So whenever you're offended is that you took offense. Let's bypass that note as we look into the word. Amos was born in a place called Tekoa in chapter 1 and verse 1. And the Lord sent him to deliver messages to the, the two tribes of Israel because they had fallen away from God. Some thought that they had. It was a time of idolatry. It was a time of extravagant indulgence. It was a time of immorality. It was a time of corruption, even in the judicial process. It was a time of oppressing the poor. So it was a real, real bad situation. If you think we're going through bad situations, now think of this. Although I think that ours, uh, our situations are really worse. And the Lord took Amos from picking fruit. This is one of the problems why we're not hearing the word of God in the pulpit. I'm getting ahead of myself, but some of y'all are in the seat the next Sunday, so let me tell you now. Amos was a picker of fruit. And when he came to town with the message of God, the arrogant people tell him, get back up in the hills. You don't belong to down here. Check, Andrew, could you check that for me? You bring up those verses. You don't belong to them. You come down here, so prophesying the God's people go back in. It's like when they asked David, who was going to be the king, who you left those few little sheep with? We have come to the place where we have so much arrogance in the pulpit. Everybody got to be called a doctor. As though God's sick. You know, everybody's doctor this, doctor that. As though God is sick. So we are not, we are not, we are now not listening to the pickers of sycamore fruit. We can't listen to Mason or Carmichael or any, any of those. We have to go, my favorite word, we've got to go to the intelligentsia. Paul had a lot to speak about that in 1 Corinthians chapter. I'm getting ahead of myself, I don't know. But Paul said, when I came to you, I did not come with excellency of speech. And that is what you're getting in the pulpit today. Everybody has excellency of speech. Everybody knows the syntax. Everybody could put the, their nouns and verbs and things together. It's not like the fellow who wanted to get the girl at a dance. And he watched a whole line and he looked at her. And he said, I can't let this dance close unless I let this girl know my feeling. So at the end of the dance, at the end of the, when they ready to close the door, he went to this girl and he said, the girl, what are your name? You wouldn't listen to, you wouldn't invite him to your church. What are your name? You know, we don't want that in our pulpit today. Because we have doctors and lawyers sitting down in the pews. Doctors and lawyers that are on their way to hell because of their lifestyle. But we come in the pulpit and we've got to we gotta take toe to the tulips and we can't say anything to, to offend somebody who you know is into extortion. Charging more than you should. That you should. That's extortion. So we are sanitizing everything that we got to say in the pulpit today. Not this church. You in the wrong place if you want something sanitized. And even when we go on Zoom, I hate to have to edit anything. I want people to know what happens in church. I want them to feel the telos of what is going on in the church. I want them to feel as though they're sitting right in the pulpit. I mean in the pew. But we got to sanitize everything. But look what Paul said. Read with me everybody. And I brethren, read and I. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. I didn't come to you in a big long talk. But listen, look at the next verse. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. If you preach Christ, you're on good ground because Jesus 
is the power of God unto salvation. You preach Jesus, people will get saved. You preach Jesus, people will get healed. You preach Jesus, marriage will be together. You preach Jesus and uh, 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 all that husbands should do and wives should do and children should do. You preach Jesus and all that just fits in place like a jigsaw puzzle. On the other hand, you have preachers who are like divers. A diver will hit off here and you don't see him again until he gets down to the end. All between there, he's giving you the news of the day. He's giving you what the psychologist says. He's giving you what the psychiatrist says. He's giving you all this to the exclusion of the word. Brother, do you understand the power of the word? Do you know in Genesis chapter 1, about four times the Bible said, and God said, and he saw, and God said, and he saw. You want to see it? Go to Genesis chapter 1. And God said, let there be light. And he saw. You see, the word of God is God himself. You find that in Gen uh, John chapter 1. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the word is God. When you're speaking this word, it's God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 14, somewhere around there. The word became flesh. Wave at me if you understand what I'm saying. Am I getting above your head? I don't want to do that because I want to start loving the word. You are not again going to go to sleep at night unless you read the word of God today. I don't care if you read two lines, but the word of God is important. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. It works. So then we go to Genesis and we see, and the Lord said, and we're going to see that so many times. The Lord said, let there be. And you have got to come to the place where you say what God says. We're probably going to be talking about that on Tuesday night or Thursday night. The confession of your faith. The confession of your faith is different from the confession of your sin. The Lord said if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the confession of your faith. You confess what God says. If God calls something adultery, you don't twist the name. You confess what God says. We're going to get into that. That's why you got to open. You want to speak the word. Not thinking about it. We've gone to the place that we're thinking the word as though we're practicing yoga. No, no, no. It's not thinking the word. You got to open. Look at this. God said, let there be light. And there was. Two verses down or so. You're going to see the other one. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. And the end says, and it was so. And then you go a little bit later. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whatever. And the Bible said at the end, and it was so. So I'm trying to tell you, you've got to know the word, and you've got to speak the word. Like Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. I don't have this in my notes, but it just popped into my head. Look at this verse. So when you're sick, you're going to open your mouth and say what God says. When you want a job, you're going to open your mouth and say what God says. That is the word. You've got to say what God says. That if you will confess with your mouth. Let's go back. Oh yeah, it's right here. To be saved, you need two things. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. You see, confession of your mouth is important. You've got to know the word. You need a healing. Faith is not a blind leap in the dark. Faith is not saying, I believe. So, because the next question is, what do you believe? What do the word say? What does the word say? What does the word say about your marriage? What does the word say about your relationship to your husband? What does the word say about your relationship to your wife? It all boils down to what the word of God says. The word of God must, must, must be preeminently featured in your life. The word of God. And as important as that is, the Lord said there's coming a time when there's going to be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. Well, of course, that means that I won't be around. I'll be in heaven. Because if I am on the earth. You can hear the word of God. I, be, I tell you. I've been accused all my life in my preaching. I've given too many scriptures. And I said. I, I, I said. 
How can you tell a fisherman he has too much ocean to fish in? You want to fish in a bucket? I have 66 books to preach. We should stop in church talking about teaching people how to be entrepreneurs. We should stop that. Teaching people how to cook. Teaching people how to be, to be. Look, the government spends so much money. Are, are you listening? Are you listening? Don't distract you, never know. Government spends so much money to make those facilities available to us. Use them. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. We have 66 books. And those of you who've been in church 20 years or more, I can risk a bet that when you put all the scriptures that you've heard uh, in the 20 year, last 20 years, you have not even covered five of those books. And we got 66. What time we got to tell people about being a plumber? I'm not saying you don't tell them. But there's another place for that. So everybody wants the church now to be some sort of institution like a polytechnic. You even want it to be a polyclinic. We must specialize. The church has to do with spiritual things. So we specialize. Let the people at Samuel Jackman teach you how to be a plumber. He's right in order. I don't want him to try to teach you salvation in any debt. Any debt that teach you to be saved, but that job is for the church. Anybody, I'm not sure if you agree with me. Anybody understand what I'm saying? We have if you understand what I'm saying. I am not asking you to, do, to agree. Just want you to understand. So, no wonder there's a famine for the hearing of the word. I'll go home now and listen to some churches across Barbados. I do that when I go home. And there's no word. I don't mean to be critical, but listen to me. As much as you guys love T.D. Jakes, Check his preaching and see how much scriptures and his what he says. Hardly any. He's a motivational speaker. I know lots of you like Joel Austin. I love him too. So I'm not really trying to be critical. I'm just teaching to give you an example. How much scripture do you hear Joel Austin preach? He's a good speaker. He's a motivational speaker. If I'm beginning to feel down or anything, let me go to Joel Austin. Boy, Joel Austin will tell you something that will raise your, your, your faith. But no scripture. No wonder there's a famine for the hearing of the word. We want to hear the word. We want to hear the word. Look at what the word does. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I ain't going to see some of you say till next week when this is all over. So let me tell you something now. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Look at the word of God. There's no other word like this. I was listening to a lady who was in the Islamic religion for 20 years. Reading the Quran. She got saved after she realized that God, her God wasn't hearing her. The Quran wasn't saying anything. She picked up the Bible, started to read, and all of a sudden the Bible came alive. Why? Because God is not a liar. That's what it says there. For the word of God is quick. That word quick means alive. That's why you need to read the Bible. That's why somebody needs to preach to you. Because I love to know when they preach to you, they're screaming. I mean, I mean tw twisting and turning because of the word. Because they know you got it. I ain't come here to waste time. But I like to watch. I, I like to watch and see what's happening. The word of God is supposed to prick your conscience. The Bible says that. The Bible says that, and if you don't go there right now, Ephesians chapter 6, just pull it up, verse 12, that the word of God is the sword of the spirit. If you have a sword jabbing in you all the time, you're not going to feel comfortable. So you're going to like that pastor. You're going to like that church. But it's the one that you should like. And the pastor is so stupid, he's going to veer off course. Forgetting that the Lord says, Pastor, be careful when all men speak well of you. If everybody's speaking well of me, I feel comfortable. No, I give you all the license to start talking my name. I give you all the license. But in light of that scripture, it says, be, Beware when all men speak well of you. Pastor, you aren't doing something right. You aren't mashing the body corns at all. You aren't slapping the body upside the head at all with the word. You, you, your sword need to be wetted. That's the word. I know wet is word. Let, let's, let's put wetted. That's W-H-E-T. Sharpen. The word of God is the sword of the spirit. When I preach, swords are supposed to pierce you. 
So that you will come to a place where you say, uh-uh, if I'm going to see God's face, I'm going to have to line it with his word. Some of us think that God got to line it with us, you know. Some of us think that way. No, no, we got to line it with the word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Look what it does in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. You got to get back to the word. I'm praying for a revival of the Bible. I'm praying for a revival of the Bible. We don't even have to bring them to church anymore because they're on our telephones. And that's, that, that is so bad sometimes. You can't mark your Bible. You can't say it with us. But look at this. The word of God is alive. It is powerful. Man, use it. Speak it. Without doubt. Without unbelief. It is sharper than the two-edged sword. And you think when it comes over the pulpit, it's not going to stab you? The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. A, 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 a edge on one side, an edge on the other side. Could you imagine that going through something as tender as a heart? Have you had a pig heart? Could you try putting a two-edged sword through that? It will go through like, like, like a fork in butter, a hot fork. But look what it does. Not only is it like a two-edged sword, because sometimes God will work in such a way, and there's some people whose hearts are still unmoved. You ask me if I know some? Yes. So he got to do something else now. He's not using the sword now. He's using something like an ice pick. The ice pick is going to pierce. You see the second step here? Look at it. Look at it on the screen. Now, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, but the piercing now, the piercing is like I speak. It is really sharp now. It has to go. Why do pastors preach this kind of stuff? If the people leave, then you're not responsible. We're going to look at that in a minute in Ezekiel chapter 33 where the Lord said, Minister, open up your mouth and say what God got to say. When Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 1, uh, I can't talk because I mumble and I stutter. The Lord said, you better open your mouth and say what I tell you to say. Lest I confound you before the people. I've sent you to break down, to pull down, to tear down, all that kind of stuff. We're going to bring that up on the screen because I want to know that this is so, this is a, this is a word church. You're going to feel uncomfortable sometimes. My granddaughter told me she went to the doctor yesterday and he had to do something to her feet, to her foot. But didn't give her anything to deaden it. So he had to do a lot of things that was hurting her. I ain't giving you nothing to deaden you either because the Lord didn't give me that. All he tells me from Proverbs chapter 17 something is that by the sweetness of the words, you get knowledge. So I've got to watch my words and make sure that they're not harsh and whatever. But there's a difference between harsh and firm. So by the sweetness of the, uh, uh, of the lips, of the words, uh, te you, you get teaching because some people have a, a lot to say, a lot of good stuff to say, but by the way they say, it, nobody learns anything. So those are scriptures you got. Oh, look, it's right there. God bless you, sister. I'm going to adopt you when I get back home. The wise in heart shall be called prudent, and the sweetness of the lips increases learning. So when I speak to you, it has to be sweetness of the lips, but not to the place where it's not firm. It's not harsh. It should not be harsh and insulting and all that. That's not sweetness of the lips. But where the sweetness of the lips it's going to increase learning. If you understand what I say. Notice I'm not asking for agreement this morning. If you understand what you say, wave both your hands at me. All right, good. I'm going quite well. So we're back at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. And we're going to see that it is sharper than any two-edged sword. It, piercing, it pierces to the dividing of the soul and spirit. You have a glass of water. And anything that can get down between the water and the glass. That's what the word of God does. So that when you come to church, even without saying something, you might just think about it. You might just have it planned for after service. And the word of God discerns it right from the platform. Look at the end. Uh, it, it pierces asunder the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow. And you know the marrow is right inside the bone. How are you going to separate the two of them? The word, that's the power of the word of God. Listen, but I like the last part. And is a discerner of your thoughts. Sometimes I can look in your face and tell what you're thinking when I preach. I agree with he. You might even reach over the end there and say, they said the same thing. This is bad, bad manners anyway. You know, you know that. You, you, don't, you don't talk, go have a conversation, join the public speaking. I've made it speaking. 
as much nonsense that I should be talking about. I wouldn't do that. Anybody understand what I'm saying? I ain't asking for agreement, you know, asking for understanding. You understand what I'm saying? Good. It discerns your thoughts and your intentions, what you intend to do. That's what the word of God is. Let us update that. Let us go to New Living Translation for the same verse. And we're going to read, read it. And then we're going to go to God's word, which is a crazy translation. And we're going to see. New Living Translation. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Cutting between the soul and the spirit. I tell you. Between the joint and the marrow. Look. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. When I first came to this church. Some people especially from Ball's Land. Were always falsely accused. Of talking people's name with me. You know. And like that. The word of God is able to do that. A king said at one time. I have somebody in my, um, in my entourage that telling the king all the plans that I make. Who is it? Somebody here. Because every time I make a plan to overcome right here in this area, the king knows about it and he doesn't pass there anymore. Somebody sensibly say, no, no, no. Bed chamber. Look for bed chamber and you'll find it. Somebody said, no, no, no. It is that fellow Elisha, the man of God, that tells the, the other king, Everything that you say is in your bedchamber. That's how the word of God works. The Bible doesn't have to tell me. The Bible doesn't have to tell me. That's how the word of God. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Let's use another crazy translation. Do you have God's, God's word down there? Or do you have um, the ESV? No, the ESV is too near to the King James. I like... Uh, Something like God's word, something more up to date, because I want to understand that this is what the word of God does. When you come to church, nobody can tell anything about at all about you. It is that the word of God judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Ah, let's read the NIV. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing your soul and your spirit. Huh? To dividing your joints and your marrow. It judges the thoughts. Oh my goodness. And the attitude of your heart. I said ever since about 10 years ago that I was going to put on the front of our church. You know that thing that said the skull and the crossbones or whatever it is? Anybody know what I'm talking about? It's, it speaks of danger or whatever. Man, look, coming in this church is dangerous, huh? Coming in this church is dangerous. Not that you have some dangerous people. We ain't got none of them out here. Shut up. But, uh. In the book of Revelation, in the last chapter, the Lord says that there's a blessing for hearing this word. The Lord said, if you take away from the word, or if you add to the word, there's a curse upon your life. You probably haven't read it. Let's see it. Let's see it. Revelation, I don't know which chapter. But uh, you hear so much word in this place. That I myself, God, be careful. Every now and again, I go to the Lord and say, Lord, I still save. Especially when I start thinking something weird. Or even doing something weird. Because the Bible says, I'm not weird. The Bible says, be diligent to make your call in election sure. The Bible also says, uh, search the scriptures to see if you are still in the faith. Because people who are once in the faith fall away. We don't believe in eternal security in this church. We don't pre preach that. You can lose your salvation. But anyhow, listen to this. Read it for me, everybody. I want it coming out to you. But for, for I testify unto every man. That heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things. God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. You, you, don't go any further. You, you understand that? That if you add something to the word of God. God said I'm going to add the plagues to you. But listen let's continue. Let's continue. Verse 19. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy. What will God do? God will do what? God shall take away his part. When you read that, how could you come up with eternal security that you can't lose your salvation? When it here says that God will take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You got to be careful with the word of God. You got to be careful with the word of God. Listen. A fellow went into a place in Canada last month with a Jesus saves shirt, he was arrested and put out. You preach the word these days, 
that's what happened. Let me, let me bring this to a close by saying this. L let me read verbatim. According to the American Library Association, the Holy Bible is ranked as the sixth most challenged book in America because of its religious viewpoint. So there's some books that are challenged America, I mean the Bible is one. In some places, I think Canada might speak under correction, the Bible is considered now to be hate speech. The Bible is considered to be hate speech. Yet, with all the pressures on the Bible, by the way, the pressure on the Bible will never make it extinct. Never. Heaven and earth will pass away. Isaiah chapter 40 verse something. Heaven and earth will pass away. But my word shall never pass away. Those of you who are trying to assert, to change the word of God, to, to line up with how you feel, and instead of the Jehovah's Witnesses lining up with the word of God, they changed the Bible and wrote their own Bible to line up with what they think. So they have a new Bible called, not new, it's long, wrong for a long time. Their Bible is called the New World Translation. So they changed the word to, to jive with what they think. No, it's the other way around. You change what you think to line up with the word of God. Look at this. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but what? But my word shall not pass away. I love that. Man, there are people today that I won't believe them even if they were sitting on God's throne. They're pathogenic liars. Liars. They'll stay before your face and lie through their teeth. Not so with God. I can trust him. When they start to worship him, there's some words that come to my mind all the time. And one of those words is trustworthy. You are trustworthy. Listen to this. Although the world and the Bible is so, under so much pressure, yet there are a growing number of pastors who are abandoning biblical teaching and the message of the cross. Some of them are big on television and you like them. Some of them are big in Barbados and because they say, come and hear a word of prophecy, you go there, you never hear a word from the Bible. You hear, God is going to bless you in the future. I see a red car in your future. I, I, God is going to give you a husband. A drunkard could tell you that. A drunkard could tell you that. Are, are you understand what I'm saying? We want the word because we could go back and check. Not that I'm saying, not that I'm saying that prophecy is not important. Prophecy is important. Anyhow, rather than telling people they are lost sinners in desperate need of salvation, these false teachers proclaim glowing messages of prosperity. Glowing messages of self-esteem. Glowing messages of political activism. Like marching. God didn't tell us to march. God gives us directives. You want to heal the land? Let's see it. Second Chronicles 7.14. Who, whose report are you going to believe? Huh? There are people who will march. And the marching is fine. There ain't nothing wrong with the marching at all. Let the dead, spiritually dead, bury their dead. Okay, so people will march. I ain't got nothing wrong with that, but not me. That's not for me as a child of God. This is what the Lord tells me to do. Read it loudly, everybody, if you're not ashamed. Read it, everybody, if my people, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, what will happen? No, stop there, stop there, stop there. The first word is what? Then, so something happens and then something else happens. Then what the Lord said. Now you got to think in your mind as you read this, whose report you're going to believe? The fellows who organize in the march down bridge town, whose report you're going to believe? Listen to this. Then what God will do? Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and what? Re read that, read and do what? And heal their land. God has the prescription. If you follow the scripture, you're not dung tongue walking up broad streets, sweating like a pig. Your feet tired. Your husband ain't getting the breakfast because you got to go and meet the people down there. In St. Patrick's, a man from Four Square Valley came up in 11 o'clock service. They just show up, by the way. 11 o'clock service with a bowl. With a bowl of rice. And he walked right up to the pastor. This happened in St. Patrick's. I know exactly where I'm not lying. And his wife, who was more holy than Jesus in that church, was there. I like people to be more, holy, more holy than Jesus. I ain't got a problem with that. The man walk up the aisle. He's not a Christian. He's telling the pastor, look at this. Look at this. She always done here, giving in the impression she's this and that. Look at what she left for me. A bowl of, a, a bowl. Look, look at this bowl of food that she left for me. I think that day it was rice and salt fish. 
you see how we got to be very, very careful as a child of God. But listen, let's get back. That was just ultra virus. That was just ultra virus. So look at here. The Lord who knows best gives us a formula that cannot fail. Cannot fail, can never fail. But we choose to dump what he says and follow the organizers. Let the unsaved people do the march. There's nothing wrong with the march. Voices are heard, whatever. Nothing wrong with that at all. But if you, na if you name the name of Christ, this is what the Bible said you should do. The Bible said you ain't got to pay $7 in bus fare to get down to town with the march. You ain't got to buy a new pair of shoes because you're going to walk so far that the others will not get out. You ain't going to be sweating and tired and your heart beat up and all that. No, the Lord didn't say do all that. The Lord said, if my people. See, he's not talking about the other people down there in the march. He's not talking about them. They could do whatever they want. They could do whatever. But now he's resting my people. My people. If my people who are called by my name. If they will humble themselves. That word humble yourself speaks in the original language of getting down on your knee. If they will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And turn from their wicked ways. That's the problem. That's why this verse is not working. Because too many church people, including me sometimes, are too wicked. Wicked. It can't work like that. It can't work like that. The Lord said, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. So why are these pastors and ministers proclaiming glowing messages of prosperity self-esteem and political activism why number one for filthy lucre for filthy lucre in bible times filthy lucre meant money today it means more than that today it means the applause that you get the applause you're so good you can preach so good and all the applause and all those things that make you feel good now come under the heading of filthy lucre notice the word before lucre is filthy it is also filthy. It's not that a member of congregation can't say that was a good message or whatever. They're not saying that. But motives, motive has a lot to do. So they do this for filthy lucre. Uh, number two, they do it to have people speak well of them. They do it to have people speak well of them. Pastor, if you will study to show yourself approved, you will preach with such an anointing and give people the word of God that whereas they really thought that they would have speak, spoken evil of you when you release the word of God and they see the power of God in the manifestation of the Holy Ghost, they will have another thought. But they do it these days and water down the gospel and sanitize the gospel to have people speak well of them. Thirdly, they do it to maintain membership. I don't want nobody to leave. I don't want nobody to leave. Man, no matter what you do, you can leave. No matter. No matter what the pastor does, people can leave when they want to leave. That is just how the cookie crumbles. Number four. Philippians chapter one, verses 15 to 18. There are those who preach Christ out of selfish ambition. It's self. And they just want to move forward. They just want to move forward either in the church or they want to move up the social ladder. Let's read this one. Philippians chapter one, verse 15 to 18. Let's read it in the NIV. And you'll see the Bible says that there are people who preach Christ for filthy ambition, for, for, for selfish ambition. Although the Lord says that you should not do anything out of vain conceit. Look at the scripture up here. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry. That's a good reason for preaching Christ. But others out of goodwill. The latter, those out of goodwill, do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. But verse 17, the former, those who preach Christ for selfish ambition, they preach Christ out of selfish ambition. They're looking for advancement for themselves. You can't preach Christ, the, the true gospel like that, if you're looking for advancement. Not sincerely. They're not doing it sincerely either. They're supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in change. Selfish ambition. So all these are reasons why the gospel is sanitized these days. Why it's not preached. Why people are tiptoeing to the tulips. And I have some more that I'm going to give you another time. But let's revert to our text for today. This is our anchor verse for these four series. Amos chapter 8 and verse 11. Let's read it in a number of other translations. The Lord said the time is coming when there's going to be a famine. 
there's a dethroning of the word. Human beings are now on the throne, even in the puppets. Where Jesus used to be and where Jesus ought to be, people are doing this for filthy lucre. They want people to speak well of them. They want the membership to be maintained. They do it out of selfish ambition. And there are about four or five other reasons that I have that I will show you why it is happening today. Let me tell you something. It is not going to happen here under my watch. When I put other people to preach, they can preach what they want to preach if I don't stop them. But for me, I'm going to preach the gospel. Because the Lord said, watchman, if you see danger coming and you do not warn the flock, the people will die in their sin. I really feel like reading that in Ezekiel, you know. The people die in their sin, but their blood, preacher, I'm going to require at your hand. Because you did not sound the alarm. But preacher, if you sound the alarm and they continue the same way are going like many in this church are doing, then they will die in their sin, but you would have saved your soul. How many of you know that, that scripture? Do you find that one in Ezekiel chapter 33 or Ezekiel chapter 3? I have five minutes and we'll come up in five minutes time. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 3 or Ezekiel 33, if you go back to King James, I want you to see that, that the watchman is here for a purpose. Not to look fancy. Not to dress in thousand dollar suits. And he said unto me, son of man, uh, more of you said unto me, son of man, but go, okay. Eat the word, eat the word, partake of the word, go, go down some more, all the way down. And you're going to see the scripture where he says, uh, when the Lord, when you see that tragedy is coming, it doesn't say tragedy, but that's what it means. And you minister, you don't, huh? Verse what? 33 what? Ezekiel 33. Ezekiel 3.33. Let's read this and see. So sometimes you don't understand my position. You take my position. Somebody said the other day that a pastor's position is only to have a 10-minute sermon for Sunday morning. That's all he got to do. Ezekiel 33. Verse what? Verse 5. Verse 5. Ezekiel 33. 5. Thank you guys. What would they do without you all, huh? Go back to verse 4. Then whosoever hear of the sound of the trumpet and take not warning, because I'm supposed to sound the warning. If the sword comes, he, he heard you know, this, but he didn't take warning. If the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. Look at the next verse. Then whosoever, verse, verse 5. He that, for why, why should his blood be on his own head? For he heard the sound of the trumpet. And he took not warning. His blood shall be upon him. But he that taketh warning shall deliver his own soul. What does verse 6 say? But if the watchman sees the sword coming. I'm supposed to be the watchman. And he does not blow the trumpet. And the people are not warned. If the sword comes and take any person from among them. He's taken away in his sin. But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. Oh, you thought coming to this pulpit is playing the fool. You think coming to this pulpit to deal with the souls of men is a light matter. So you do it when you want to, if you want to, how you want to. And people are ending up in the devil's hell for all eternity without hope for billions of years. There is a dethroning of God's word. I want this church to put back God's word on the summit, on the pinnacle, whatever word you want to use, on the apex, whatever. We need to get God's word above any other word. Your word, your husband's word, your wife's word, your pastor's word. God's word must be above. Bow your head for a little while. Take two minutes to talk to the Lord about something you just heard. Here again, do it personally. I will not always be around with you. How are you treating the word of God? How is the word of God treating you? The simplicity of the gospel.